Isometric illustration can be a very tedious process. It requires a certain level of dedication not many of us possess, certainly not me. There are so many steps involved, like creating guides and specific angles, using the shearing option to transform the vector shapes to those angles, and so on and so forth. It doesn't have to be so complicated. Having to adhere to these tedious steps means some of your creativity is lost in the process. Thankfully, there is already a feature inside Illustrator that can speed things up immensely. But strangely enough, it's one of the least used features. So I think it's about time to shine some light on the often dismissed but super powerful 3D filter. So let's get to it. I've prepared these sketches specifically for this video, and even though I didn't time myself, the whole process took a fraction of the time compared to using the typical methods of isometric design. I'll show you how to build this uh, Super NES controller, and while we're at it, some tips for using the 3D filter effectively, along with some shading tricks to make your illustrations look three-dimensional. Now, with a 3D filter, we can do three things. Extrusions, lathing operations, and rotations. At first glance, you might get the impression that these operations are not nearly enough for our needs, but actually we can do a whole lot just with those three things. And a couple more, but more on that later on. Let's see now with uh, those uh, simple shapes how the 3D filter works. We'll start by extruding this one here. With the shape selected, we'll go to Effect, 3D, and then Extrude and Bevel. Don't feel overwhelmed by the dialogue, we can basically divide it into three sections. The first one has to do with the rotation of the object in the 3D space, the second one setting the extrusion amount, and the third one here has to do with lighting the shape. For now, let's collapse the lighting options and concentrate on the two main sections. This little preview here is our view into how the shape is going to be rotated. The blue highlight just tells us where our original shape is located in the 3D space. So, in this case, this is where our shape is located. If we keep the mouse down, we will get a useful preview as we rotate the object. Let's go with something like this. And let's extrude the shape a little bit more, and hit OK. Now, here's a couple of cool things about the 3D filter. First off, the 3D shape is still live, so we can enable and disable it in the appearance panel here. But the reason having the 3D shape in a parametric way is this. We can still edit the shape while the 3D effect is on. So let's say we want uh, one side to be longer than the other. We can just select the points here and just move them around and the 3D shape adjusts accordingly. Or let's say we don't want this uh, T shape anymore and we want a slope here. We just move the points around and we're done. Another cool thing is that we can manipulate the rotation of the 3D shape just by rotating the 2D shape around. Super, super handy. Because of the parametric state of our 3D object, we can stack other types of effects, and they're all applied live to our 3D object. So if, for example, we apply a pucker and bloat effect on our 2D shape, our 3D shape changes as well. We can keep stacking things up, and everything will work as expected. For example, we can add a drop shadow, and at any time we can enable and disable the effects, adjust the values, and so on and so forth. You get the point. Now let's move on to the other 3D operations. Let's go with lathing. With the half circle selected, we go again to Effect, 3D, but now we choose Revolve. Let's collapse again the lighting info and see the rest of the options available. This one here allows us to choose which side is going to be used for the lathing operation. This side here will give us this result, while this side will give us this result. And of course, with the angle, we can set how far the shape should be rotated. With the offset option, we can set how far from the center point the rotation will happen. Nice and easy. Now, let's check what we can do with the rotation. Here the only option available is just a simple rotation of the shape. It might not sound like much, but it's extremely important when creating isometric illustrations as you can set up individual shapes in the correct perspective. Now that we have the basics down, let's start building the Super NES controller. I'll have a link in the description below with a blueprint of the Super NES controller so you can easily follow along. 
Keep in mind though that you need to redo most of the shapes since they have an insane amount of points. If you use them like that, the 3D operations are going to be incredibly slow and besides that it's just very inefficient to work with this many points. But the shapes are simple enough so we can reproduce them quite easily. If we compare the two circles, we can immediately see the difference. 4 points compared to probably 100. Now for the more elaborate shapes, we can just use the simplify command. So with our shape selected, we just go to path, simplify, and just select the value we need. Picking the auto option will be a good compromise between few points and shape preservation. Now with that out of the way, we can start building the elements of the controller. First create two copies of the controller and group the shapes of one of the copies. The reason we're doing that is to have a reference to where everything sits in relation to each other. You'll understand what I mean in a little bit. Let's run the extrude command on the group and here's the most important part. In the position dropdown, we click on one of the isometric options. Let's go with isometric top. But I want the controller to face the other way, so I will just invert the values in these two fields. So instead of 35, we will do minus 35. And instead of minus 30, we'll do 30. And that's it. We don't need to create isometric guides or draw all of these shapes by hand one by one on the isometric grid. Illustrator did that for us and we didn't have to break a sweat. Now that we have this as a guide, we will start building the individual elements. For now, we will ignore the stroked shapes and we will concentrate on the filled shapes only. With those selected, we run the extrude command again, we select isometric top, we adjust the values, and done. Our controller is ready. <laughs> Just joking, but we're closer than it looks. Now, all we need to do is move the shapes in the right place and adjust the extrusion values. We can overlay the reference shape, but for now I'm just going to do it by eye. The cool thing with the asymmetric perspective is that no matter where our shapes are placed, they will always look correct in relation to each other. There's no shift in perspective going on. Now that we have the base of our shapes, we can start editing them. Just make sure to create a backup copy in case something gets messed up in the process. So with the shape selected, we go to Object and Expand Appearance. The shapes are not converted into vectors, but notice what happened to the vector shapes. We have a lot of extra information on the main shape of the controller and also the buttons. Sometimes this is needed, but for the type of illustration we're going for, we don't need all that. We can merge these shapes one by one, but this is incredibly time consuming, so let's go about it in a different way. With the main shape of the controller selected, let's adjust the settings of the 3D filter. In the lighting section, we have this blend steps option. If we turn it all the way down to zero and then run the expand appearance command, you will notice we have fewer vector shapes. But there's still a lot more than we need. We can simplify things just by getting rid of the lighting information completely. We do that by going to the lighting information dropdown here and selecting no shading. If we run the expand appearance command again, Notice how simpler this shape is. That's exactly what we need. We repeat the same process to all other shapes and in the end we have exactly the amount of information we need. Keep in mind that every vector of a 3D shape, like uh, this button here, is a group. So if we ungroup everything, we have direct control of the individual shapes and we can also further optimize things. For example, we don't really need the bottom of the button since it's not visible. We can also further get rid of other shapes by merging them together. The rest is art direction. It's just a matter of preference how we want to render the controller. We can get rid of lines, we can color things in a specific way, it's up to us. Here for example, on the cross I combine some of the shapes so there are no vertical divider lines. Now that we have all that set up, how do we apply all the other smaller details? We just select all the strokes and apply the rotate command with an isometric view selected. I chose isometric top and after adjusting the values, we're all done. Our shapes are now in isometric view and we just need to expand the appearance again and move everything to the right place. Make sure to ungroup and get the vector shapes out of the clipping masks so they're easier to edit. It really is that simple. 
All the text details were done exactly the same way. I just type the text and then use the rotate command. No need for isometric grid, shearing and specific angles and so on and so forth. It's a really, really simple process, which is exactly what we need. We minimize the time spent on technical stuff and we can concentrate on the things that are important, the actual art direction of the piece. Now, let's check another one of the illustrations. How will we go about creating this shape? I'm not talking about the sphere here since it's just a circle with a gradient, but the shape underneath. This could be done easily with a boolean operation in 3D, but we don't have that in Illustrator, so how else could we approach it? If we divide the shape into smaller chunks, it's obvious that these shapes are just rectangles with a part of them cut out. And that's exactly how these shapes were done. I drew a rectangle, which I then cut out a part of, and then all I had to do was to use the rotate command of the 3D filter. This side has the isometric left view enabled, this side the isometric right view, and last but not least, this shape has the isometric top view enabled, but with some adjustments of the values. And that's it, that's the whole shape. To sell the effect, we just shade the shapes accordingly. This side has two layers of the same shape. The top shape has a whole gradient that ends in transparency, and the shape underneath has another colored gradient. This side is just a solid color, and the top side has again a highlight layer and another layer with a colored gradient. The middle shape uses a gradient with transparency for the bottom part, and the shape underneath uses the mesh tool. This is one of the options I typically use for shading. The other one is a new addition to the gradient tool. Let's see the mesh tool first. It basically subdivides the form by creating a grid that loosely follows the shape and allows us to color individual points. It would be tricky to create this highlight without the mesh tool, but with it we can achieve the effect in a matter of seconds. So with the object selected we click on the mesh tool and start adding the grid at the specific points we want to accentuate. Now it's just a matter of selecting the grid points and picking the color we want. The other really useful shading option is the freeform gradient. With a freeform gradient enabled, we can start adding points and connecting them with lines. This part is not necessary, but depending on the shape and the effect we're going for, we might need it. And then it's just a matter of moving the lines around and achieving the look we're after. Both of these tools can be used interchangeably. It just depends on what works best for the shape. With isometric illustrations and basically with any kind of work, we just need to figure out the smaller components a more complex shape is made out of. Let's take this simple isometric design. How would you go about creating it? You can pause the video if you want to have a think. The solution is quite simple. There are two cubical shapes, the left side and the right side. So far so good. Now let's start dividing the shapes even more. This cube is made out of three smaller shapes, one tall L shape, one shorter L shape, and finally one small cube. The cube to the right is basically the same as the first one, but rotated around. Here's the tall L shape, the shorter L shape, and finally the cube. Now that we have the individual shapes figured out, it's quite simple to build the whole illustration. Let's create a 600 by 600 pixel artboard and set a grid every 200 pixels. So the first L shape has a thickness of 200 pixels. I will draw two individual rectangles and then join them together. The second L shape has the exact same thickness. And of course I follow this same procedure as before. Finally, we have the 200 by 200 pixel rectangle. What we essentially drew here is the top view of the cube, so now all we need to do is extrude the individual shapes. We pick isometric top for the 3D view, and for the extrusion of this bigger L shape, we extrude the full height of the cube, so 600 pixels tall. The second L shape is 400 pixels tall. And finally the cube is 200 pixels tall. And just like that, the first cube is complete. Now, the second cube just has a different projection, so after duplicating the shape, we just choose isometric left on all objects and just rotate the shapes with the rotate tool. 
and that's basically it. The rest is just art direction. I've just joined some of the shapes together, like these ones here, then I added a couple of shadows, and we're all done. Couldn't be any simpler. The last thing I would like to mention before closing is one final awesome feature of the 3D filter and that's texture mapping. We can assign a symbol to any surface of our 3D object. Let's take as an example this simple rectangle. If I click on Map Art, we get a dialog that allows us to cycle through the different surfaces. Notice the red highlight indicating the surface we can map our texture on. Once we get to the surface we want, we can select a symbol from the drop-down and that symbol is mapped onto the surface. We can of course move the symbol around, transform it, and do whatever is needed to map it the way we want. And since it's a symbol, whatever change we make, it applies to the 3D object as well. Once we expand the appearance, the symbol is then converted to normal vectors, which we can adjust accordingly. This can help us achieve some more complex effects. Let's take as an example these donuts I'm working on at the moment. It started with a simple circle, which I slightly deformed with the roughen filter, and then applied a revolve. The frosting is created with this rectangle shape, which has its edges distorted through a roughen filter. It's then mapped onto the surface, and because I want to have further control over it, it's a duplicate 3D object with the actual donut geometry hidden. This is just one of the things we can do with mapping. We can achieve a lot of complex effects just with mapping alone. I encourage you to play with 3D Filter and see what you can come up with. If you're even remotely interested in isometric illustrations, I would encourage you to start using the 3D Filter instead of working with isometric grids. It's much less tedious and more importantly, much faster. Hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, please don't forget to like it. It helps the channel immensely. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.